thank you very much, Elliot. I'd also like to shout out a thanks to uh, Fernando and also to Owen. I, I think they are slaving away at a very important concert that many of us will be attending after, um, after we make it through this talk, uh, <laughs> assuming that we do make it through this talk. Uh, one slight uh, adjustment to the title, it's uh, not about spatial audio, but about uh, spatial music. And uh, it, it has a title that I already have concerns about. It's, it's called The Future of Spatial Computer Music. And I guess if, if I wanted to um, wrap in a little bit of anxiety, maybe I should call it the future of spatial computer music, provided that it has one, because I sort of go back and forth on it. But this is a kind of a rah-rah talk about why I think that there's some exciting things um, <clears throat> in the future of, of uh, spatial music, despite the fact that you could make an argument that it's one of the serial failures of electronic music. But we'll, we'll get back to that. So I'm going to uh, just start reading this paper, and uh, I may argue with myself a bit. Feel free to join in. Um, OK. The creation and manipulation of sound and the performance of sound into space constitute two fundamental areas of interest that bridge the transition from instrumental music through analog electronic music to most recently computer music. Early interest in the manipulation of musical spatial experience in classical music is attested to by the antiphonal music of Giovanni Gabrielli and Adrian Rillard and um, Thomas Tallis's famous 40-part antiphonal motet, Spem in Allium. So these were uh, pieces of classical music that involved groups of singers or performers in different parts of the space that did a certain sort of call and response and were using the space in, um, <clears throat> in ways that emphasized location of sound source. So interest in spatialization continues in instrumental practice with offstage instruments in such works as Beethoven's Lenore Overture No. 2, Charles Ives' The Un Unanswered Question, and also charts indicating precise spatial placement of instruments in the symphony orchestra may be found in the music of Bela Bartok, Elliot Carter, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, and Henry, Henry Brandt, all with the intention of creating striking spatial musical events. And Stockhausen's Gruppen would be a very good example of, of that. So we, we haven't even gotten out of electronic music, but it, it should be clear that in the cla classical music practice, already there's a great interest in the use of space as some kind of element of musical articulation. With the ad advent of electronic reproduction of sound, the spatial aspect was exploited in short order, with spatial distribution of speakers for the telharmonium hidden behind ferns, which I think is really cool. Uh, I mean, they, they didn't, didn't want you to actually see where the music was coming from, but it was coming from lots of different places in the room. Uh, Multi-channel performances by Theremin in the 1920s, and famously with the projection of Xenakis' Concrete PH and Verez's Poem Electronique through hundreds of speakers in the Phillips Pavilion in the 1958 World's Fair. Other notable 20th century examples include the Osaka Expo from 1970 and the still active Audium performance space. How many of you have been to Audium, by the way, in San Francisco? It's really, really a remarkable space. Um, and uh, uh, Stan Chaffee plays the same four-track uh, composition every night. He's gotten really, really good at spatially projecting it. Um, spatial deployment of sound is often an important aspect of sound in artworks, sound artworks, such as Janet Cardiff's The 40 Voice Motet which is a reworking of Talus's spem in allium for 40 loudspeakers rather than live singers. <clears throat> it is evident that sound in space remains a potent research area for contemporary composers and sound artists. Audiences often grasp the special nature of spatial music as compared to more standard stereo or proscenium presentations of music, um, which, which is to say that um, if, if, if we want to be a little bit populist in our outlook, um, the sort of fun of having sound sort of flying all around you can be a little bit more palpable to people than um, a general audience members than uh, trying to count 12-tone um, tone rows during pieces. 
as, as one example of where spatial audio can be quite palpable. Okay, so music for large numbers of speakers also commands a social presence that stereo music does not require. Since spatial electroacoustic music must be performed in special venues with appropriate multi-channel sound systems, whereas much stereo electroacoustic music could be fairly appreciated at home on a good stereo system. And as, as we know, there's a kind of an atomizing aspect to the internet of just having lots and lots of private listening, but spatial music, you really have to come out and hear it. Okay, now I'm going to um, maybe delve into some slightly contentious arguments within the world of computer music, which is to say uh, arguments that nobody outside of the world <laughs> cares too much about. But here we are at Karma, so I'll, I'll, I'll try, and I hope some people will find this interesting. So uh, this section is entitled Timbre Above Space. So despite continued interest in creating and theorizing about striking spatial experiences as part of digital music, as evidenced by such writing as Dennis Smalley's Space Form and the Acousmatic Image, that's an article which is really quite interesting. Many of you probably know about uh, Dennis Smalley's theoretical work and spectromorphology as a way of thinking about electronic music. Uh, so his, uh, his article in Organized Sound, Space Form and the Acousmatic Image, basically attempts to bring in the spatial experience of sound as one more building block in, in spectromorphology. And it's, that article is very worth a read if you're a computer musician. Okay, interest and energy directed towards sound synthesis and processing, referred to here as timbre composition, has remained widely predominant over spatial concerns in contemporary computer music practice. There are many reasons for the emphasis of timbre composition over spatial composition. Both analog and digital timbre design techniques achieved striking triumphs early on with the musical and theoretical works of the competing schools of Electronische Musik and Musique Concrète. The push into digital music in the late 1950s quickly produced the Music 5 model allowing for broad timbre experimentation, frequency modulation, LPC, and numerous sound transformations made possible through the application of the fast Fourier, Fourier transform. Timbre composition retains considerable momentum from these early successes. That's number one. Number two is that timbre tools are ubiquitous. When fixed media electronic music first emerged as an area for compositional research in the late 1940s, opportunities for composers to work in this field were severely limited by the paucity of electronic music studios, such as the WDR, ORTF and the Milan Studio di Phonologia. There, this is a really important aspect too because what it stresses is at a certain point in the history of electronic music, the absolutely uh, um, critical element of institutions. Um, outside of those institutions, there, you had very few opportunities for experimenting with electronic music in the late 1940s and early 1950s. So over the course of the next two decades after the 1950s, electronic, analog electronic music studios proliferated to a growing number of university music departments and other institutions throughout the world, such as Columbia, Princeton, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and Goldsmiths, uh, University of London. Equally important was the development of independent studios, such as the Cooperative Studio for Electronic Music in Ann Arbor. So that uh, was part of the site for the, the Once Festival, uh, and, and the San Francisco Tape Music Studio. From the 1960s forward, commercial manufacturers such as Moog and Buchla enabled individuals to purchase electronic music equipment for experimentation in private studios. The development of computer music facilities followed a similar trajectory, with computer music systems originally developed at Bell Labs migrating to such institutions as Princeton, Stanford, UC San Diego, and IRCOM, and I think we would probably mention Karma too. Um, by the late 1980s, it was possible, if still alarmingly expensive, for individuals to purchase personal computers with built-in DACs and ADCs, such as the Nextcube and SGI Indigo. 
And uh, when, when I was a, a student at, at UCSD, I, re I remembered um, with both alarm and admiration uh, that my colleague Christopher Penrose, a very um, forward-looking computer musician, bought a Next computer. He, uh, they cost $10,000 at the time. And you know, in, in, in the late 1980s, uh, $10,000 was real money. He put it on three credit cards. I, I don't know if he's paid it off yet. But, um, but in any case, you could really start, start um, purchasing your own computers. But prior to that, you really had to be at an institution to, um, to, to get access to, um, to these tools. So by the end of the 20th century, it was quite common for composers to own notebook computers vastly more powerful than the mainframes to which they would have been tethered at institutions only 15 years prior. Today, in much of the world, it is rare to find a composer who does not own a computer. OK, so technological advances really help to proliferate the experimentation of, uh, with timbre and computer music. So now I'll, I'll get to the point which may or may not be contentious, but I'll say it anyway. Timbre innovation may be nearing saturation. So the ubiquity of hardware and software tools for sound synthesis and processing is reflected in the music heard, heard at the ICMC since since its inception in 1974. The prevalence of a concern with timbre in the computer music community is such that as early as 1994, Agostino de Scipio could propose a two category model for computer music consisting of algorithmic composition and timbre composition. Indeed, the concern with timbre composition extends well beyond the domain of computer music into the areas of popular music and sound design for cinema, among many others. However, I would suggest that we now have a timbre problem. Innovations in the tools and techniques for timbre composition have been slowing for some time now. No new computer music technique in the last 20 years has had nearly the impact of frequency modulation in the 1970s or FFT-based processing in the 1980s. And our recent computer music seems to reflect this fact. I'll get a little bit personal here. I, I have heard many fine computer music pieces in the last few years, all of which sound to me as if they could have been composed using timbre tools available 20 years ago or more. <clears throat> if this seems like a bold assertion, consider the aggregate evolution in, in the sound timbre world of computer music between 1965 to 1985 as compared with the evolution of timbre between 1994 and 2014. A slowdown of innovation in timbre composition seems evident. This is not necessarily a bad thing. The stabilization of the modern orchestra by the early 20th century left room for decades of fruitful musical creation in that medium. The same may hold true for timbre composition. And I want to underscore the word may. Um, <clears throat> but practice-based computer music researchers may need to look elsewhere than timbre composition for the kinds of fundamental breakthroughs heard in John Chowning's early um, FM pieces, Paul Lansky's uh, LPC composition Six Fantasies on a Poem of Tom Thomas Campion, Barry Truax's granular synthesis composition River Run, or Christopher Penrose's spectral processing composition Fraud. Spatial composition is a domain of computer music where such fundamental advances may still be possible. At the same time, spatial research requires sounds to spatialize and the remarkably rich timbre palette of digital sound developed over the last half century presents a wholly adequate basis for grounding the coming developments in spatial computer music. So I said this was gonna be an optimistic talk. Um, okay, so looking at it from the other, other standpoint, because um, I think there's, there is a very strong case that, that spatial sound, spatial computer music is really exploding right now. I think there are also some arguments that it might be a total failure. Uh, so anyhow, the question um, that I ask myself is what is holding spatial computer music back? If spatial music is so promising, why do we still hear relatively little of it? 
There is certainly no shortage of papers on spatialization in recent years. And it is significant that the call for music in the 2014 ICMC specified an opportunity to perform pieces with as many as 24 channels. In fact, we do hear a fair number of pieces for eight channels, which has become something like the new stereo at electronic music conferences. But spatial music for large numbers of speakers is still relatively rare, in concert at least. There are significant obstacles that might explain the current situation. Composers are faced with quite limited access to performance spaces providing installed multi-channel systems with large numbers of speakers. There are still relatively few such studios and performance spaces in the world that support composition of computer music for, more, for 24 or more speakers. If a composer is not fortunate enough to work at an institution that provides such space, access can be very difficult indeed. Some institutions that support large multi-channel systems do not have a dedicated space for them, such that their, system, their speakers must be rigged for every performance, of which there are few because of the exhausting setup and teardown efforts required. These speakers otherwise remain in storage. I, call, I refer to these as boxed systems. So uh, examples of boxed systems would, would be the grail at, at present. Uh, the hydro unboxed. what presently unboxed. it's presently unboxed but soon to go back in its box um, the beast system in Birmingham um, the hydro system at, at Harvard um, I'm, I'm sure we we could come up with others the, the alternative model is what I call the installed um, I, and I use a HDLA for a high density loudspeaker array so um, installed um, HDLA systems would be, for example, the, um, the, the Aircom system, the Allosphere in uh, Santa Barbara, uh, Zcam, the Clang Dome, uh, the, the Cube at Virginia Tech. And uh, in my experience, we're moving institutionally more in the direction of installed uh, spaces. I think the reason for that being that as people plan these spaces, they, they already have a, a performance space in mind, or, or they build them. So, so optimistically, I expect that we're going to see more uh, installed spaces. <clears throat> but anyhow, compared to, um, and, and this is the next point, um, in addition to the problems of very few of these facilities and access to these facilities being decimated by the fact that a large number of them are boxed, there's another problem too. Compared to the huge variety of software tools available for timbre composition, the tools for spatial composition are few and relatively undeveloped. Commercial DAWs like Pro Tools have very little to offer composers who wish to work in larger multi-channel formats than 7.1. I don't know, maybe they do 10.1 or maybe they've expanded a little bit, but uh, in general, uh, DAWs are a very impoverished space for working on multi-channel music, but that's where almost everybody goes to write uh, computer music. So that's a sort of a problem, and I think it's also, to me, a very interesting problem, and for me, one kind of indicator of where, the, where an avant-garde exists. Um, and if, if I can digress a little bit, I think that I think there, there still are avant-garde's in the 21st century, but I think that they look very different than avant-garde's of the, the 20th century. They're a lot more subtle, they're, they're, they're a lot more quiet, and you, you more have to know where to go look for them than that they, they will come finding you. So for me, one, one of those sign points is um, that if there's some area um, in, in the world of digital media, where the software is utterly terrible or, or non-existent, that's probably an avant-garde. And so the, um, the support for spatial composition is just utter, utterly terrible right now, which I think is a good sign. Um, okay, so um, 
continuing from there, more progressive acoustic compilers like C Sound and Super Collider can pre present hard coded limits on channel numbers for reading and writing sound files. Such software obstacles can be overcome, but the solutions require coding skills that not every computer mus music composer possesses. And finally, composing for large numbers of speakers is considerably more difficult than composing in stereo. And just going back to the, the coding issue, I, I think that there's a fair question of whether composers in, of computer music still need to program. I mean, those of us who have been doing it for a long time might by reflex say yes, but I've seen a lot of people make a lot of really pretty wonderful computer music with zero programming skills. So um, I'm sort of on the fence about that, but if you do want to work in spatial audio, that is one domain where I think you really need to have some, some coding abilities or know somebody who does. Okay, hedging spatial bets. In the face of the above mentioned obstacles, composers often add their own forms of resistance to full spatial practice. When faced with an opportunity to present a piece in a multi-channel space with a large number of speakers, a commonly accepted solution is to compose for a smaller number of channels that are available at one's local institution or studio and then perform a live diffusion into the multi-channel space. While not an unreasonable solution, this does limit the ability to make full use of multi-channel space since as Natasha Barrett, an expert electroacoustic composer and diffusion artist, has pointed out, there remain spatial effects that require more degrees of control than our two hands can produce in real-time performance. And I'll add one other thing about that, which is that unless you really know what you're doing with, with diffusion, it's um, adding more speakers to the mix can actually make your music sound worse. And I had a very um, um, interesting uh, demonstration of this back in a, a Linux conference at, uh, at ZKM in 2006. And they, they had a concert that was presented in, in the Clang Dome. And there were two pieces that were composed in multi-channel format and then projected that way. So I, I brought my first, um, first multi-channel piece uh, that I'd written in 2004, an eight-channel piece, and setting it up in the space was basically very simple. It said, okay, this track goes to that speaker, that speaker, that speaker, and then we were done. Um, and, and I have to say, I, I, I thought that my piece sounded very, very good, very spatially clear in the space. Ludger Brummer had a piece for 20 speakers that he had composed. He's the director of the music research at ZKM, he, and he made it for the space. It sounded spectacular. I mean, there, there were just really some extraordinary feelings of space moving as clouds and, and all kinds of really unusual things happening, but that were very clear and very strong. Uh, and then, then there were four stereo pieces, and they all sounded terrible. And I think part of it was the composers didn't Nobody had a lot of time to set up for the concert, which is a kind of a common situation that we have to deal with in electronic concerts. But what, what the composers all did, they had their stereo um, signal, and then they had faders for all of the speakers of the Clang Dome, of which there were 43. And they were just sort of constantly put, pushing the same sound to lots of different speakers, creating these kind of you know, accumulation of, of, of resonances, phase cancellation problems, and just a kind of general muddiness. And it was just really palpable to me how different the results were between these, you know, these spatially conceived pieces and these sort of not carefully thought out diffusions. Now, to be fair, a well thought out and skillful diffusion can also be quite uh, powerful spatially. Um, anyhow, getting, getting back to um, self-imposed limits, we just see com a lot of composers are asking themselves, you know, if I, even if I have access to a space with 43 speakers, why would I run a, write a piece that can only be played in that one space in the world? So that's, that's one of those um, problems. Um, I mean, arguably, it's, this, it's uh, an even more severe problem for someone who's thinking of writing an orchestral piece. I mean, why would I write a piece for orchestra that'll never be played? Or maybe it will be played once, 
um, you know, be sight read um, by, by the orchestra be, between the two uh, Beethoven pieces. So that, that problem exists other places too, but um, at least where composers have an out, they'll, they'll go for it. Um, okay, so a piece that settles on the lowest common denominator of what several multi-channel spaces have to offer would seem to have more performance opportunities than a piece that takes full advantage of the capabilities of a single performance space. Indeed, it must seem a singularly perilous endeavor to compose music for large numbers of speakers at the present time. But the riskiness of the undertaking can hardly be considered an objection in the context of experimental music. Experimentalism is embedded deeply in the DNA of computer music. And as argued above, timbre composition may be a domain showing diminishing returns for experimentation. By contrast, computer music composition for large numbers of speakers is an area ripe for experimentation and discovery. All of the elements that make spatial composition such a difficult prospect might well make the pursuit all the more attractive to the most daring composers. And I have a um, test case of this that I'm going to skip over. My, but I'll, I'll jump to my conclusion here, which is that we propose that spatial computer music is at a, an, an important historical moment in which spatial aesthetic and research initiatives strongly suggest themselves to both institutions and creative individuals. It is hoped and expected that we will witness dramatic aesthetic advances and experiences in spatial computer music from these cor um, corners in the coming decades. So that's the paper side of things. So now, now let's talk about it. What do you think? <laughs> Yes, Matt. Yeah, well, a couple quick reactions. So uh, there's a lot of ambisonics fans around here, and mm -hmm. here one of the selling points is, well, you can just encode it to ambisonics, and then you can decode it in the Grail or in the Alsphere or in the Beast or wherever, and it'll just magically take advantage of all the speakers mm -hmm. in, the, in the perfect way. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's one kind of claim that you're not addressing with your point about the uniqueness of the spaces, right? That that is a kind of counter argument to that. Mm. It's one I would love to address. Yeah. May I? Please. <laughs> okay, well, it, I don't have a problem with ambisonics. It's, it's quite nice and, and done, done well, especially at high, higher orders. It, it, it can be quite compelling. And also, something that we're getting very interested in at, at Virginia Tech is how do you transmit spatial experience? from one space to another. And I know that there, there are a few other researchers who are doing those sorts of things to give a performance one place and then broadcast spatially to, to multiple venues. I think that's really interesting. I think ambisonics is limited in the sense that it, it has the, as, as its model, well, it has two, two models that I, I take issue with. One is the, the model of the sweet spot. I, I've, I kind of declared war on the sweet spot about 10 years ago because I, I, my problem with it is, first of all, that you're, you're pretty much telling people that if you're not sen sitting in, in the center of the room, you're, you're getting a, um, a, a very inferior experience. You're not really um, getting the composer's uh, vision. And that also plays into the argument against doing spatial music in the first place that, that was quite prevalent in, in the 90s, which is people said, don't waste your time with space. It's a weak cue. It, the, it just degrades so easily. Forget about it. Think, f focus on timbre and, and pitch and things like that. Um, but my, my counter argument to that, <clears throat> to the sweet spot, is if you think of spatial composition, as, which you can really do for large numbers of speakers, as a sculpture, then it becomes a lot more interesting. And in fact, you sitting closer to the periphery becomes a different, valid, and sometimes more interesting place to sit than in the center of the room. Because there might be details that you might put just in one part of the room that you'll notice when you're sitting closer to those speakers. Sit someplace else, you'll get other details. You'll have, you'll have different perspectives on, on motions. So, so ambisonics is, is, again, about trying to create an idealized spatial scene in 
what, what's hoped to be a relatively large sweet spot. Um, but uh, I think getting outside of the sweet spot is, is desirable enough that, that Ambisonics isn't going to do it for me. The other thing is that Ambisonics is, like a lot of other ways of thinking about spatialization, very much based on a spatial object mo model. The idea that you have some coherent sound source that you're hearing placed in a, at some um, distance, at some location with respect to the listener, may be moving, may be fixed, but in any case, a coherent object. And I'm, I have no, no problem with coherent objects, but I don't think they're the only kind of musical objects or even the most interesting objects to compose with. So I'm, I'm really interested in sonic objects where different pieces of the object are in different places. And the simplest example would be if you were to split up, say, a trombone note and take all of the different harmonics and put them in different um, speaker locations. So again, ambisonics really doesn't help so much when the, um, when the image is incoherent, at least in, in my experience. So, so I guess what, what, the answer to that is that ambisonics can do some things for you. And, it, and what it definitely does answer is that problem of, gee, I have this wonderful spatial experience in this room. How do I translate? transfer it to this other room without spending the next two days writing code. Because um, my alternative to ambisonics is what I call sp um, spatial orchestration, which, which is an approach. The, I, the idea that I take, uh, or the approach that I take, is, is if you want to sque squeeze the most um, spatial enjoyment out of a particular space, you should try to compose for everything that that space has to offer. And so that means that when you made the, um, a piece in a particular way, it just, I mean, just as an example, taking a, a piece of spatial music from the Virginia Tech Cube to the Sonic Lab in Belfast. Well, the Virginia Tech Cube, um, is a black box theater. The, the lowest speakers are, floor, are a, a floor mounted ring of, of, of 10 speakers. Um, the Sonic Lab has, um, has 12 speakers underneath a hollow floor. So of course, if you were going to go from um, Virginia Tech to Belfast, you would want to take advantage of those speakers and reorchestrate the piece. And that's not really an ambisonic move. It's a matter of reassignment of speakers. Um, in some cases, it's thinking about something that had been, let's say, assigned to four speakers in one context. Now, all of a sudden, what happens if you have 64 speakers? So it's, it's rebuilding the piece, and that takes a lot of work. Um, but that's, that's kind of the trade-off. And then if you're lucky, then you can go in and, um, and, and take pieces in, into these spaces and really get, get something strong out of them. Um, OK, so I, so I, didn't, I don't want to say that ambisonics is bad. I just think that there's, there's more out there. Um, OK, other, other questions? Charlie. So I, I, had, I had two questions, or two things I hope you'd say more about, one of which connects to Matt's question. And just, I was expecting you to say a little bit more somehow about um, points of audition, especially like multiple points of audition, and the possibility of moving auditors, and um, how, how you might conceive of that mm -hmm. if you're thinking spatially, and, and as being one of the ways that spatial composition does provide you know, aesthetic, you know, kind of realms of, exp of aesthetic exploration that you don't get from temporal composition in mm. the same kinds of ways. Oh, you're terms so right. Of time and, and space and motion. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's one. I, I'll ask the second question in a second, maybe, if I can. But we'll, oh, okay, well, let, let, yeah, let me address that. And, and that presents a, a kind of a dilemma um, from because our standard way of presenting a concert is that people sit down in one place. Um, but if people are moving around, then it becomes a little bit more of a party environment <laughs> where you don't necessarily get the, the attention that you want. But you, things can be so wonderful. I, honestly, uh, when I was sound checking my 
second piece, I think the piece that will be on tomorrow evening's concert called Shakers, there's this one part right at the end uh, where basically there's, there's this piano cluster that's being articulated it's, it's all about antiphonal movement. So every, every pair of notes in the cluster are moving back and forth, just between two speakers alternating. And so at different speeds. So what happens is as, if you're more towards the center of the space, it all kinds of builds up to, into this kind of rich, but kind of hard to fully grasp spatial articulation of some kind of chord. But once you start moving towards the periphery, then you start hearing a couple of notes of the chord. And if you start walking around the periphery, your sense of the harmony changes as different dyads within that, that cluster come, come to the fore. So you're absolutely right. Just simply by virtue of, of walking around the space, you change the piece. And, and as you said, you become a, a physically active explorer of it. So. Um, I don't know what else to say about that, except that, yeah, and in, in some, you, you kind of can't have, well, no, I take that back. I guess you could have both. You could have a concert performance and tell people, feel free to sit in your seats or feel free to get up and walk around the space. Um, another thing that would be interesting, I think, if you were sitting down, is if you're sitting down and people are walking in front of you and including the, including the space, that might add another interesting uh, layer of complexity to, to the spatial experience. So I agree with you 100%, and, and you're absolutely right. You, don't, you won't get that in stereo. So what's your second question? Oh, I guess it's maybe related, but um, to do, I mean, I guess because your abstract suggested you were going to get back to the question of timbre and how timbre has been inflected by, by questions of spatialization. Mm -hmm. But like in, in your kind of um, history of, of timbre that ends in 1994, um, <laughs> I was just struck that, you know, of the major developments that happen after that, it's true that I guess most of them are coming from outside of traditional computer music, university, you know, kind of or art music mm -hmm. um, spheres. But you know, they all happen around the late '90s. So you know, all digital uh, production in popular music, mm -hmm. you know, um, no analog stage necessary, um, all digital editing. Um, the emergence of so-called microsound around you know 1999, you know, with this kind of more interesting kind of iterations in, in EDM, like ambient techno and stuff like this, with kind of precise control of timbre and mostly discrete, you know, sonic objects, but subject to these mm. kinds of very precise processing that mm. listeners of every sort are supposed to be like following in real time. And then um, the, the the third one is just the convergence of uh, digital. Um, uh, you know, sound design in film and digital music production in film, where they're using the same software, often using the same kinds of sonic palette, such that you know you can't always make clean divisions between um, sound design and music. You know, Foley sound. Oh yeah. So all all of these things um, imbricate um, spatialization and conceptions of timbre, but they don't seem to be leaving timbre behind as a realm of of exploration. Mm. And, um, and they do seem to me to have like had pretty profound effects, at least in popular music and film, mm -hmm. uh, on mm -hmm. the borders of, of kind of like EDM and, and experimental, um, you know, kind of electronic music. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't, I, don't, I don't know that you need to, yeah, I mean... I no, I, I totally want to dive into that. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, well, first of all, I guess what I would say is, I, th I think that all digital editing of pop music uh, was well in place uh, before the late 90s. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. what changed was the project studio became all <laughs> digital. There you go. Which, uh, <laughs> you heard the project studio, you wanted to do some recording. But he's also doing like, camera and spatialization <laughs> at the same time, like the pan thing, and he's like moving his head around. Like, but but really one thing that you, you said I, I definitely want, uh, I, I think is important, you're absolutely right that especially in the worlds of, um, of film music and television music, there's been a lot of exploration of, of timbre or digital sound. But I would say exploration more than innovation. Yeah. Because in a lot of cases, I mean, it's, this has been the case arguably forever that, you know, um, in the world of, of experimental and classical music basically functions as, as R&D for the popular industries. And so, 
you know, there, there was a, there's a television series recently called Hannibal. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it had an extremely interesting approach to the score. I mean, the score is basically, it, it's, it's basically all, it's all, um, it's, it's all computer music and percussion. I mean, with very few exceptions later on, but it, it was almost completely atonal, non-melodic, non-harmonic. Non I mean, it's a very strange show in a way, right? Because I mean, it's like a kind of a, a mashup of a a a, a, ser a, a serial killer show, uh, a, ho a homoerotic love story show, and and a cooking show, all sort of wrapped up to into one with random com computer music behind it. <laughs> I mean, how how could you not not enjoy that? Um, but but any, I mean, you could even go far as far back. And, and further, no doubt, but certainly as far back as, as Mark Snow with the X-Files, because the, the, uh, the scores for uh, the X-Files were really basically you know, MIDI-based um, electronic scores with uh, a fair amount of interest in, in sound design as, as behits, befits a sort of you know, sci-fi horror genre. But getting back to your main point, I would argue that all of those things that you mentioned, um, di digital production, um, Microsound, IDM goes quite, I, I would put IDM really more at the beginning of the 90s. I mean, the, the really crunchy DSP stuff that I knew about was really starting to happen with Aphex Twin around 1994, 95-ish. And then, what's really interesting, to my ears at least, from what I know about techno these days, a lot of that went away. As, as people started using more, um, standardized tools, things like Ableton Live, for example, that don't make it uh, as easy to do that timbre experimentation and that differentiation, um, that sort of smoothed off a little bit. Because I, I, I don't know how many of you know this, but, um, but Aphex Twin worked very closely with James McCartney, who's the author of Super Collider, to uh, do extensions to Super Collider. So he's doing a fair amount of his uh, computer music in, in the mid to late 90s in, you know, on one of the weirdest computer music programs <laughs> that exists, which is pretty cool. But again, I would really stick to it. I, I, I mean, if you think about like a, a timbral innovation that had the impact of, again, I go back to FM. I mean, you know, once FM hit the DX7, it was just all over the radio. I mean, it just really changed, uh, you know, the course of 80s music um, as a new thing, as a, as a new sound, and not not just going and and you know, sort of refiguring something. And and microsound is really, you know, we're going going back into uh, you know Zanakis's, uh research, research going back into the 50s. So I I, I would stand by my assertion that uh, that that uh, you know, it's a very Shankarian kind of, you know, um, grumbly sort of argument, you know, like music was over in, uh, you know, 1899 or whatever it is. I, I really do think that, I'm, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, you know, knock it out for the count. And as I said, timbre exploration is still an incredible world for moving forward. I also think that, you know, if we finally wind up with um, quantum computing, where, where we can really bump things up uh, on a few orders of magnitude. We could really start exploring different models of, of creating sound that really might um, push things forward again. But I mean, have you noticed how computers stopped getting faster a few years ago? So, so I think, you know, we, we have a couple of bottlenecks in, in, in that area. Um, so I don't know, does that kind of... Um, That's a good answer, yeah. Mm. Thanks. Uh, other other questions? Yes. Um, so I think generally electronic music can really lack a live performative aspect to it. And so in that sense, um, your story about just having to deal with rows of faders and trying to push stereo around space um, makes me wonder what other means of control there might be and how much you've explored that or considered it. Live control. Mm -hmm. Well, I've just been delving into it myself, and I agree with you. For a lot of listeners, 
you know, we, we have in, in, in the Western tradition an, an extraordinarily abstract form of music that, that um, we're into that gets often, not always, and certainly not, you know, in the present so much, but, you know, separated from things like dance and image and religion and sports and all sorts of other things. It's like just pure music. Um, but I think a lot of people really do like to see some kind of action or activity. Uh, I recently had Pamela Z out, out to um, Virginia Tech and, and we collaborated. And part, part of that, she already has a, a, really, a really lovely um, and, and very effective and affecting practice of building music in real time by recording her voice and, and overlaying it. And, and also sometimes you know, using different kinds of sensor devices. And she, she, does, she has lots of really witty um, kind of gimmicks or ways into individual pieces that, that, that are all, they really require performance. In, in most cases. So we were doing things like ha having her sing uh, particular lines and then just zooming them up to the ceiling. And those are the sorts of things. It, you know, it was, it was so nice because I had a, um, an introduction to music technology class, just a, you know, a bunch of undergraduates who had almost no experience with any kind of experimental music whatsoever. And you know, precious little experience with what we might call you know, classical music. Uh, and I was just getting report after report about how blown away they were by this, and they were amazed to hear the sound flying around the the room, and and so there there's something palpable about the um, the feeling of motion that that you can get with spatialization. Now that's a different thing from the actual performative um, aspect. I I have mixed feelings about it myself. If one one of the prob well yeah one of the problems with performance is that it's very much forward oriented not necessarily but in most cases it is you have performers on stage you're looking on stage i had a very interesting experience with a group i had in belfast called the noise quartet and i made a piece with um with the group that involved basically the the group playing very intense loud music from start to finish but as and the group was on stage and as it was happening created a sampling machine that would gradually sample pieces of what was happening and then just put them into these changing loops one speaker at a time in, into the space until the entire space was filled up and I thought that was going to be a remarkable spatial experience and I would say it was you know Maybe a B minus spatial experience. Uh, I mean, you still de definitely had a sense of, of the sound in the space, but seeing the performers on stage, it just pulled your ears right in front. So even though the sound was literally all around you, you were looking at the performers, and something about the processing made you feel that the, the sound was just up there where the performers are. If there is not a fixed object in space for you to look at, I think it allows for the performative or, or motion-like elements of, of spatialization to come to the fore. And I, I also think that, you know, to the extent that spatial practice is an, is an experimental practice, I really do think that it is, we have to do a little bit of pushing aside some other things that we usually focus on in order to bring the whatever might, there might be in, in spatiality to to the fore. That's that's my sense. Uh, I'll go to you and to you. Question. My question is uh, somewhat related to what you were saying, which is having a visual cue, like you were saying. But instead of having fixed speakers, which is very expensive to have twenty-four speakers fixed and have it you know, always there, uh, the virtual reality world that's gearing up visually, uh, if that can be merged with the, the spatial. I, I'd love to be able to walk around an orchestra and have that. I mean, it'd be a very complex, very large program, but be able to hear Beethoven's Ninth and walk around and look around. And so I'd have these two to four speakers on my head and I'd be able to hear things. And so that'd be, I don't know if, if your spatial work could 
work in that direction as opposed to having you know 24 speakers you have just four but as you move your head around it it, inter it turns those speakers into different speakers apparently mm -hmm. so is that being done or? oh yeah absolutely i i think you're right not only that i think that inevitably that's going to have a bigger future than the kind of music i'm talking about because it's cheaper as, as you said way cheaper um, I mean, the, the two things that sort of get in the way of things being developed are um, one, money, and two, laziness. And the, the, thing with, the thing with money, of course, you know, yeah, I mean, these things are expensive. These spaces are expensive. They're not that expensive. And you, you can really calibrate how, you know, how much you want to spend. I mean, if, if, if you have, I don't know, $30,000, you could, you could put up a, a, a creditable spatial um, audio environment if you, if you have a room to start with, um, which, is, which is not a huge amount for a, um, an, an institution. But you're absolutely right. Um, binaural um, encoding, recording, and motion tracking in, in the context of virtual reality, it's, it's, it's already good. It's going to get better. But, um, and my, my only concerns with it you, you can't really do the, the sculptural thing the same, quite the same way. The, ex, the exploration you're doing is a different kind of exploration because, because it it's, it's, um, it's becomes very private and, and, and you're, in, you're not in a real physical environment anymore. But yeah, it, it's, it is in that same world of spatial exploration, I think it has an uh, undeniable, obvious, huge future, especially when you consider the, um, the potential intersection of, of uh, virtual reality with gaming. I think un there's no question about that. That's going to be massive at a different scale. Your question. Yeah, well, um, to have a question about basically how to address things with language in a way. So I mean, I think, I think that's what you're talking about, spatial composition, it's a very, it's a, it's a topic about imagining things, right? I mean, you're, you're imagining the space and you're imagining, for example, ambisonics also, you imagine that the sound is gonna come from over there, but when you actually listen to it, you're not gonna hear it there because you're sitting in the wrong place. And so it's, it's basically there's this idea of formalizing and imagining things and then versus the actual auditory result, which you can actually hear as a person. And then the third component is, for example, the interior dialogue of a composer who has a certain opinion about how things are supposed to work, and mm -hmm. maybe, and maybe it, it just works for him or her at that moment, right? And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm also wondering, like, how do you how do you come to terms, right? and how do you make terms really stick or be actually valid? You know? mm -hmm. Well, I think this this really comes down to practice. I mean, I've talked a little bit about the the problem with not a lot of really great software out there. It's, it's gradually improving, but I think what we really need more than anything is to work on our skills. And that's, that's why I think we need to have more spaces where people can really spend some real time there. Because you know what you talked about, the, on the one hand, you imagine hearing something, and then you hear something else. Well, you know, every 14-year-old who tried to write a string quartet has the exact same problem, right? Thought, <laughs> thought it was going to sound one way. Maybe not so much now that they have Sibelius and Finale and they can kind of play it for you. But you know, back before, you know, when you really had to imagine what a score was going to be like before you had a lot of experience, it probably, you probably had some surprises <laughs> when the piece was actually played. It's the exact same thing here. And as you develop your skill, you, you get more of a sense of how something is going to work. And so, um, I, I, again, this, this is, and, and I'll say as, as a brief advertisement for, for some of what we're trying to do in Virginia Tech, everything that we're doing in, in terms of the, the musical side of the cube is really focused at trying to build up opportunities for people to create music in these kinds of environments and then share them. So, so we have a workshop that, that we run in August. And I'm very proud of the fact that, that we bring in all sorts of people. I mean, we've, we've had you know, full, full professors fly in from London. We've also had graduate students. We have um, someone who's a, um, um, an audio engineer who, who works in a planetarium who's coming in. So what we're trying to do is get lots of people from as many different areas who are interested in deploying spatial audio and then we 
Then we bring them into the cube for five days and they get three hours a day of just intensive work in that space. We have another um, multi-channel space around the corner uh, called the Perform Studio, which is, has um, a 24.4 system, which, which is also quite nice. So they go back and forth between the cube, the Perform, we have a few orientation classes and a few classes to talk about various techniques, but the, the majority of the time in the workshop is spent for them to develop their skills. And then what we do is at the end of each day, we all come together and just talk a little bit about what people are doing, what sort of problems they might have encountered, ideas. And, and so everybody gets to help each other out. And then at the end of that workshop, we have a, a public presentation of, of the work and I have to say it's really impressive what people were able to develop that was you know really spatially rich and articulated in, in just five days of work in the space and we just added to that a, a festival called the Cube Fest and I think this is the first time this has ever been done could be wrong but with, with our call for work we only our programming works that were conceived and realized for large numbers of speakers. So we're not programming any, any stereo music. We're not programming any 5.1 music. We're only programming pieces that, that were composed for at least 24 channels. Because I know that some of the other, other um, um, festivals, well, the Beast Feast, for example, uh, and at Birmingham, in Sonic, at uh, ZKM, um, Bing over here, it's, it's kind of a mix. Some pieces were conceived for large numbers of speakers, others not and are, are being upmixed. So we're really trying to push people to think about what you can do with large numbers of speakers and also realizing the way that institutions like um, the Cologne Studio and so forth function is that they really did, the reason they were able to make the huge contribution that they did to the future of electronic music is because they made themselves available to composers who had a vision or desire to work in this new medium. And we're trying to make ourselves available in, in that same, same way. And I think it would be a good thing for <laughs> lots of other institutions to do that too. Uh, I also think my, you know, my theory about this, which could be totally wrong for a lot of reasons, is that where we are with uh, high density loudspeaker arrays for spatial computer music is basically the 1950s uh, with respect to electronic music. Almost no, there's almost no place where you can go to do it, but the places where you can do um, this music are actually pretty impressive. There are more on the way, and it's quite possible that 15, 20 years from now, spaces like um, the, the, the Bing, an, an installed Bing, um, the Alice Field or the Cube, they'll be all over the place. And skill, skills will be diffused. And also, there's, there's a large aspect of ear training to all this, which is you really have to, you know, as, as the man said, have new ears for new music, right? And so um, you, need, you need to really kind of get in as an audience member, and that's that's also why you know from the very start we've been so interested to get peop general public in to have have experiences and and ideally enjoy those experiences and become more discriminating about what can happen in the spatial domain. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Discrimination. You say. Yes. Uh, discriminating. Uh, of course, we've heard that uh, that, uh, that uh, spatial dimension is actually secondary. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, of course, it has to do with the resolution that we can hear in space. And is there a ceiling to what we can achieve with it? How is the research in tying this as part of other things? Because one of the things that I love about Luther Brummer's music is that it's part of his orchestration. It's really, uh, it's, it's really completely tied into other elements. What you were talking about to your pieces as well. It feels that, that there's, it's completely integrated. It's not an independent development area. So, so what are your thoughts about the, this kind of ceiling, the, the, just the limit of perception, mm -hmm. the idea that this is actually a secondary dimension? Oh, it, that is so great. I love that question. Um, because it reminds me of, um, 
a class I took with Milton Babbitt where, where he basically said, all these people who are you know, doing this composition with all these funny sounds um, are wasting their time because you can't make a scale of timbre the way you can make scales with pitch. And so that, you know, the, the only, you know, the strongest kinds of musical structures will always be based on pitch and not on timbre. He's, always, he's very fond of saying, you know, there, no sound gets old faster than a new sound. Um, so that's the conservative um, model. And I'm not saying at all that you're thinking that way, because I know you're not. But um, the, I, I think the alternative to that is saying, you know, if, um, if you're thinking in terms of scaled structures, yeah, absolutely, pitch and rhythm are, um, are the best place to live. But if you're looking for something else, uh, the sky's the limit. Who, who knows? I mean, I, I, I really, I, I think that that's why it really is an avant-garde. That's, that, that's why it's, it's, a, it's a domain of, of experimental practice. Um, I, I, I hope that we'll just continue to discover new, new possibilities. I mean, for, for myself, every so often I hear something that, that I try out and there, there's this moment, honestly, it doesn't work as well in, in, in um, the Bing system as it, as it does at Virginia Tech, because um, we, we, you know, we've got our, our speakers just set up a little bit higher and we have more of them, but um, there's a piece called The Cascades, we'll hear it tonight, that, that uses recordings of a waterfall in the Jefferson National Forest. And there's a moment where I put the waterfall into the highest speakers and just gradually bring them down. Onto the, onto the audience through several layers. And in, to, to some extent, in every performance I've heard, you just really feel like the, this sound is coming down on you, which is absolutely not doable on, in, a, in a planar projection. And things like making a kind of music where you move from the cent, you walk from the center, out towards the side, and you hear something totally different. Something, I mean, you start revealing things. You have a kind of transparency because of the use of the space. It suggests to me that there might be some more things out there, some more good things. How many? I think, I think we can only discover that by experimenting. Other questions? Yes? So, I think it's interesting to look at the sort of duality between like the spectral and granular representations and, and I guess we're often kind of looking at the difference between timbre and rhythm there and, and, and there's often some fuzziness and I think that you know detailed parametric granular synthesis or sketch-like instruments where you combine fine tooth and wide tooth combs for instance really kind of bridge that gap. Have you thought at all about bridging the gap uh, you know, between timbre and spatialization in, in terms of the way that the sort of the fine grain delay structures play out? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, honestly, I haven't gotten anything I'm, I'm really super excited about. Um, I, I, what I like sometimes is just simply using space to stratify timbre. And, and there you have to go with you know, a certain psychoacoustic fact, which is that all things equal, sounds with brighter spectra tend to spatialize high. And so if you work with that and, and put sounds that have those brighter spectra into the top speakers, then you can really have something open up and, and you know, have, have that sense of elevation. Another thing that I've, I've, I've been working with recently is um, spatial harmony, building up chords from low, low to high and, and having them expand from maybe a, a very small number of speakers to covering an entire wall and then doing the, spill, the Phil Spector thing where you have a little literal wall of sound. It's, it's so interesting how different it is to have, let's say, a chord even spatialized within stereo or quadraphonic as opposed to being articulated multiply from let's say 30 different speakers 
on a wall up, up a grid. And so some of those things are not exactly temporal, but they require awareness of, of, of how you're spatially articulating the timbre. Some, some other things that, that, that I do, you'll, you'll hear a little bit of this, is you know, taking, um, I take a trombone note and break it up into its um, harmonics and then stagger them so that you really do hear the kind of cliched idea of building up a sound over its overtone, um, but different places in the space. And what's kind of interesting, this is, um, I mean, really kind of a simple and crude thing that you'll hear tomorrow is to just gradually have these harmonics overlap. So in the center, you get the sense of a, of, of a trombone note, that tromboneness. But then as some of the lower harmonics drop off, it really becomes something else. And it's, and it's in space until you have just the highest um, harmonic. And then you start getting a piano note playing that, uh, that harmonic and then come, um, turning into something else. So um, spatial articulation of timbre, I think there's a huge, um, huge possibilities. Uh, quite honestly, I, I don't think I've even begun to scratch the surface of, of what's possible there. Um, oh, I'll say one other thing, which is, um, well, let me, let me ask, I mean, how, how many of you are working on spatial or audio or music or, and are excited about it in some ways? Okay, uh, that's a lot of you, so that's really cool. Because I'll, I'll um, you know, tell you um, that when I applied to UC San Diego, um, I was already very enthusiastic about computer music. I, I had um, taken a computer music class with Paul Lansky in uh, 1983. And taking a class, it's like not really like taking the class exactly, but you're kind of in that world. Because Paul Lansky, as, you know, as, as I've learned teaching at a state university, there are different kinds of pedagogical strategies that might work one place, but not, might not work another. So I mean, Paul's you know, famous line um, in, in helping you to learn something is, you'll figure it out. So, so it, it was just sort of being in that world and just being so excited by, by what was possible. Then I went to Eastman, um, and it was very unusual. We we're talking about 1984, 85. Very unusual to have a conservatory right out in the forefront of, of technological innovation. They had a mini computer, PDP 1134, at Eastman, at a, at a conservatory. And so that was really kind of um, energizing a lot of graduate students to, to experiment with uh, Music 11, which uh, was basically you know, a, a, a variant of Music 5, which eventually became C sound. Um, so when I chose uh, a school to, to do my PhD, and this is really embarrassing, but I'll, I'll admit to it. I didn't even check who was teaching there. I just, I just looked for the places that had the fastest computers and, and had a computer place to do computer music, honestly. Um, I mean, was, when I got to UC San Diego, I, I found out that there were some quite interesting people on the faculty. But that, that wasn't a factor in, in why I decided to, to go there. And I think if, if I were looking into grad schools you know, to do PhDs right now, I'd, I'd be looking for the spaces that had, had the most speakers. Um, I, I, again, um, and, and this is really more of an assertion than anything I can really prove, but I really do feel that, that um, the spatial aspect of computer music is, is an avant-garde. And I, I don't know if I can get away with saying this, but I'll try. Um, I, I'm not sure if I believe it, but just the nature of, this almost feels like there's a kind of yin-yang relationship between the 20th and the 21st century. I'd be curious to see if you agree with me or not. But I mean, the 20th, 20th century is just you know, so dramatic um, and, and violent in a lot of ways. Not like this is not violent, but um, there, there seems to be a lot more subtlety, a lot more, there's something a lot more interior, um, a little more in, inward um, in terms of things that are happening in art. So you know we've we've already had two th 2013 uh, come and go without anything remotely looking like a rite of spring, for for example. But what uh, what I would suggest is that our rite of spring uh, is things like the Taybot, 
You guys know about the Taybot? This is one of the most unbelievable things. This is this is a one-off. This is an art. They did this it again. They did it twice. Did they, they try to? It back on. It was not a one-off. Yeah, but but when they brought it back on, I'm sure they net they wouldn't they put her in a they, they, turned, they yeah. turned it back on a few hours later. But, the second time too. Oh yeah, but once they figured out what was going on, they took it down for good. Okay, so Taybot. Oh. This is this is an example of crowdsourcing, which I think is an also, also an important aspect of of art this these days. And really, I mean, crowdsourcing really can get us more to some ideas that we were playing around with in the late 20th century about the individual author being less important in some ways than uh, his or her relationship with, with other people. So, I mean, as, as a recent example, I, I, I made this polka for a solo piano, and I went on my Facebook page and said, say you wanted to write the craziest polka ever, what would you do? And I got, you know, 50 or 60 utterly ludicrous. To top weird now. What? To top weird now. Yeah. Ex all, so what I did was I took that whole list, put it into a, a super collider program, and composed through it, randomly choosing one of the Facebook recommendations until the piece was completed. But getting back to um, to Taybot, so so Taybot, what's so, you know, it's so hilarious and so appalling at the same time. It's it's light and dark. So. Microsoft decided it would be really cool to create this ag this agent, this Twitter agent, to interact with people, and it was an adorable, lovable tween, and so this this happy uh, go lucky tween, uh, you know, what's what's the best way to get people to like you, to just agree with them, and say yeah, you're absolutely right. So it didn't take long for people to figure out how to troll the uh, the Taybot. So basically, they would, you know, come up with the most um, reprehensible, racist, horrible ideas, and the tr and and the Teva would just spit them right back at them. So you know, say things like, um, um, "Are are you in favor of genocide?" Of course I am. <laughs> Why would you even ask? And so that. I mean, it was such a shocking thing, and in, in a way, it's, it's an accidental artwork. It, 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 it revealed some aspects of society that everybody knew about, really wished we didn't know about, but in this format that was so adorable that it, it kind of knocked down your f defenses for long enough for this message to get through at, at the same time that one feel, is feeling a great deal of schadenfreude for Microsoft by being so, it, it, it's almost like cluelessness becomes a technique. And um, so that, to me, that's, that's more what right of spring like events look like. Another, another one would be obviously Donald Trump. So, I mean, that, that something like that could happen at, at this moment. I mean, ob obviously there's a, lot, there's a big downside to that, but that's unimaginable. Donald Trump is unimaginable before the, the 21st century and our, our social media. So what I would suggest is the kind of art avant-garde are much more interior in their orientation. They're, not, they're more um, implosive than, than explosive. Um, where, where they're going from there, we'll just have to see. But I, I really do think that, uh, that spatial music is, is going to prove to be one of those avant-garde. So I think we're out of time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope you'll all join yeah. us in uh, thanking Eric and then coming down to the concert, which will start in about half an hour. Thank you very much.